Gene Munster shared some thoughts on Tesla, writing this, Tesla is entering the trough of disillusionment. Good news is they're best positioned for the slope of enlightenment. This clearly about sentiment, about as bad as it gets right now, versus the light at the end of the tunnel. Let's watch a short clip of Gene on CNBS. All right, welcome back. Got a big story today in the EV world. Tesla planning to lay off more than 10% of its global workforce. Also, two key executives, one named Drew Beglino and Rohan Patel, have announced they are leaving the company. These are senior level executives. Now, Musk appeared to address the shakeup in a post on X saying, quote, about every five years, we need to reorganize and streamline the company for the next phase of growth. Tesla shares fell just over 5% today, closing at their lowest level in nearly a year. Has Tesla lost some of its magic or is the shakeup a sign of growth to come? With us tonight is Tesla investor and Deepwater Asset manage- Managing Partner, Gene Munster. Gene, you think this actually foretells growth, but we're talking about people leaving, la- being laid off. Try to square those two things. Well, Brian, I think what's going on in the next, uh, call it two to four quarters, is going to be a decline in the business. Maybe start with there. I think that this is a reaction in part to the EV demand that has absolutely hit the wall. Just look at Google Trends, type in your favorite EV and look at how the amount of interest has declined. Don't mind if I do. He did say favorite, right? So let's have a look at the Cybertruck over the past 12 months. As I record this, the most recent relative search interest in Cybertruck is out of 40 a year ago, it was at a seven. Roughly six months ago, it's about an eight. Obviously, first deliveries and a few major milestones creating temporary surges here, but hmm, curious. Let's try the five year. It's going to be a huge spike for the unveil, of course, but notice a bit of an uptick here. Trending higher, so interesting. He did say pick your favorite electric vehicle, right? Let's do a two year search. All right, so I think that paints a bit of a picture, at least for one particular electric vehicle. Let's look at some other models to see if we can confirm this. Model Y over the same time period. Relative search interests, call it 35, 40, two years ago. Today, around 66, trending extremely high. Curious. I mean, those would be my picks for the favorite electric vehicles, just personally, in terms of the value. And, but hey, that's just me. Oh, wait, no. Uh, I think the world's favorite electric vehicle is also the Model Y, if you want to go by it being the best-selling vehicle on the planet, not just electric, but any kind. And probably the most attention-capturing, iconic electric vehicle A fan favourite, if you will, is clearly the Cybertruck. Have a look for Model 3. This will tell a different story, surely. Let's see here. Two years ago, peaking at 62. The average, probably closer to the mid-40s, however. Bit of a surge, early 2023. And still around that 60 mark today. And you can note, there's a line delineating 50. The first almost one year here, below that line, and now above. Not a meaningful change higher, though. Pretty steady. Maybe he was referring to non-Tesla electric vehicles. The marquee. Well, yeah... Uh, that's awkward. Peak relative search interest, basically at 100 two years ago. Recent spike, but yeah, that's not exactly a positive trend. Maybe the Hummer EV, <laughs> the joke of a vehicle. Uh, yeah, not exactly great. Maybe the Audi Turd. Let's have a look at the Audi Turd. Hey, I mean, relatively flat, but maybe slightly increasing. Hmm, not sure exactly which electric vehicles Gene was referring to. Maybe the F-150 Lightning. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's not good. Yikes. Fucking hell. Rest in peace, Ford. Jeez, man, that's bad. Remember, this is a two-year time frame. So there's going to be some volatility around major milestones, stories, recalls, this kind of shit. But bro, goddamn, this is Ford. This is the F-150. They're literally the best-selling vehicle model in the United States is a Ford F-Series. Ouch. Maybe some of the EV startups. How about the Lucid Air? Hmm. That's not great. Seems relatively flat at first glance, but been a peak and a bit of a decline another peak and another decline relative search interest now around 40 a year ago it was call it 55 60 two years ago it's close to 75 80 all right one more the rivian r1t oh fuck yikes hmm okay i think gene has a point if you exclude tesla's vehicles i mean fuck dude uh rest in peace rivian like holy shit dude i just i'm kind of speechless i did not realize how fucking dire it was for this company Again, back to Tesla's Model Y, just for context. Now, just to be clear, what I believe is happening right now is many consumers are delaying their inevitable purchase of an electric vehicle. Interest rates are through the roof. There's uncertainty in terms of the economy, job security, mortgage payments through the roof. People can't refinance, repurchase, etc. There's a whole lot of shit going on economically that's hurting sentiment. In addition to the mechanical obstacles to actually getting finance for a vehicle, e.g. rates are too high, you literally can't afford the auto loan. 
Other consumers are just like, it's not the right time. I'm a little bit unsure about things. I'm feeling the pinch. I'll wait. We're seeing a lot of this reflected in the data here. Interest in Tesla's vehicles, especially the flagship Model Y and the A-list celebrity, in fact, S-tier celebrity, the Cybertruck, is climbing over time, despite the fact that this is a dire time for the automotive market. My suspicion, my strong suspicion is a lot of consumers have already decided, you know what, I'm going to buy a Cybertruck or I'm going to buy a Tesla Model Y. Not yet, but that's the vehicle I'm buying. As interest rates come back, eventually, whenever that happens, many of these consumers who've already decided Model Y is the vehicle for me or that refresh Model 3 looks good, are going to follow through with the purchase. Anyway, after that long detour, back to Gene, but I did actually want to do what he suggested just so we can see what he's referring to. And if you're not Tesla, things aren't looking great. If you are Tesla, I mean, hey. Google Trends is Google Trends. This is aggregate data based on search terms on Google. You can't make that stuff up. It seemed pretty clear to me. I think ultimately deliveries in 2024 for Tesla are going to be down 3%. The street's right now at plus 5%. That's come down since over the last few weeks. It's still too high. So I do think we are in a period here before what I believe will be in this period. This is the classic Gardner uh, hype cycle. Uh, We're right now in the trough of disillusionment. And I think that we are going to return to growth because ultimately, I believe electrification is just a more sensible way to move around and uh, along with autonomy. And so I still believe that Tesla's a growth uh, story, but not for the next year. Reasonable thoughts from Gene here. Now, in case any of you are unfamiliar with the Gartner hype cycle, on screen now, beginning with a technology trigger, soon after, peak of inflated expectations, then a trough of disillusionment, e.g. electric vehicles are not the future, it's the end of the world, blah, 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 blah followed by the slope of enlightenment and a plateau of productivity. Gene seeming to suggest that we're currently around peak fear, uncertainty and doubt about the viability of electric vehicles, never mind autonomy. Okay, but uh, what do you, how do you feel about $99 full self-driving? I think that uh, eventually if you're uh, somebody who's born today, it's probably never going to drive a car. I think that uh, if you look at the, the, the value on this, there's a piece where you can look at what the adoption is. If they get 20% adoption, I think that that can double their operating income by 2028. And so I think that not, it's not for everybody, but if 20% ultimately uh, decide to, to do that. And separately, eventually all car companies, just for safety reasons, are going to have to get some form of autonomy. And it's unlikely, given what the investment cycle has been with these car companies, that they're going to be able to do it on their own. I suspect over time Tesla will license some of that. Elon said he's open to that. That's a whole other revenue pe- yeah. uh, piece that is not reflected. Well, there you go. The conversation is now starting to evolve into Tesla inevitably licensing FSD. If only I'd seen this coming and put it in my Tesla valuation model when I first published it back in 2021. Wait, oh, I did, and I did. Oh, that's okay, interesting. Now, just to be really clear, in terms of the economics of Tesla licensing this software to other companies, in very simple terms, it's basically free money for Tesla. They've already created the software, and it is real-world intelligence. It sees, it perceives, it plans, and it acts based on what it sees. It's a generalized solution. In other words, if another company wants to use Tesla's FSD software... Assuming they've covered their vehicle in cameras, all that needs to happen is they've got a computer, e.g. Tesla's FSD computer, in the third-party vehicle, something comparable, but Tesla will probably just sell these to other companies as part of the deal. And in terms of adapting FSD for a different vehicle, it's really just a matter of a little bit of code and fuckery regarding camera placements, lens distortion, and that's it. Just like if you know how to drive a vehicle, you can get in a different vehicle from a different manufacturer with a different seat height, different visibility, different everything, and still drive the vehicle fine. This is going to be absolutely massive for Tesla in terms of its financial implications. It's free money, almost pure profit. And as Gene points out, and it's pretty obvious to Gene now that these companies aren't going to be able to solve autonomy themselves, meaning inevitably, for safety reasons, they're going to need to have autonomy from someone. And guess who's the market leader here with an unassailable lead, aka the safest software? Tesla. Just like one after one, just about every company on the planet outside of China is licensing access to Tesla's supercharging network, at least a portion of it. Same shit's going to happen with autonomy. And the implications here are ridiculous. And on the subject of autonomy, Tesla FSD, something that almost everyone seems to be ignoring, a decision most will come to regret. Musk clarified this after Hallmars was suggesting that Musk was betting the company on autonomy. Not quite betting the company, but going balls to the wall for autonomy is a blindingly obvious move. Everything else is like variations on a horse carriage. And from horse carriages to horse manure... Can someone check in on this guy? Is he okay? From Ross Gerber. Oddly, no one on the Tesla board of directors has resigned. 
Of course, they are ultimately responsible for the losses at Tesla. They are an illegal board of directors according to the rules of the Nasdaq exchange and has been deemed as much by Delaware courts. They must be removed. Seriously, though, is he okay? Someone who knows Ross, make sure you do a welfare check on the poor guy. I think he's showing some signs here. Hope you're okay, Ross. The Cybertruck is hitting roadblocks. According to the Wall Street Journal, the EV maker is delaying deliveries for its newest vehicle and not telling buyers why. It's unclear how many buyers have been affected by the delays, but it just adds to the growing list of concern for Tesla investors. Tesla shares closing down nearly 3% today. The stock just a hair above a $500 billion market cap amid growing struggles across the entire EV landscape, both Lucid and Rivian hitting all-time lows this week. Tough out there for everybody in this space. With me tonight for more on Tesla's latest stumble is Gerber Kawasaki president and CEO Ross Gerber. Ross, thank you for joining Last Call. Your firm has been divesting out of Tesla recently. First of all, tell me how much Tesla you own right now. Um, Currently, we own a little over 300,000 shares. Um, when we update our 13F, and we were as high as 500,000 shares at the top in the middle of last year of our position. So we paired our position fairly substantially. So Now, as far as I'm aware, just for the sake of clarity, when Ross refers to we own, he's actually referring to not the GK ETF, whose Tesla position is less than probably at least half of the people watching this YouTube channel, but the aggregate Tesla ownership among clients of their wealth advisory firm so it's not actually accurate to suggest that we as in gk own the tesla shares it's more accurate to say that our clients in aggregate own this many tesla shares just like if i were to start running around saying we as in my audience own a few million tesla shares actually many millions of tesla shares would be a little bit probably inaccurate to suggest by the way i did do a poll quite a while ago on patreon anonymous responses just to get an idea of how many shares in tesla people owned and was able to determine from that just on patreon alone there was multiple billions of dollars of tesla stock just from patreon subscribers now i didn't bother extrapolating that out to viewers of the channel because it's probably more people likely to own more tesla stock who can also afford to be on patreon so i'll just skew the data a bit but i just want to make sure that we're clear here because the way that ross says this to me suggests that he's talking about what gk the etf owns which is not correct. For those curious, Tesla Boomer Mama posts daily updates on Tesla held in actively managed ETFs. Per the latest post, GK, as in Gerber Kawasaki, the ETF, sold a third of its remaining position. Tesla's now the number 21 position out of 31 stocks in the ETF, with a 1.6% allocation and just 2,000 shares. We can see here, the GK ETF, 2,000 Tesla shares. So I just thought this was important context when we hear Ross say that we own... He's not talking about the GK ETF. Seems a bit dishonest to me, but hey, that's just me. So you've got tens of millions of dollars at stake. You're, you're not cheering yeah. this stock on the way down. Obviously, no. you know, you don't want to lose that money, uh, but you have been a test. Interesting that we didn't hear much of a clarification, actually, any from Ross there is. So you've got tens of millions of dollars at stake. Now, personally, I think Ross himself owns a fuck ton of Tesla stock, which is curious given the fact that he's claimed falsely that, what do we see Musk is a white supremacist, an anti-Semite, and so on, yet still holds the stock, I guess, profits over principles. But anyway, it's a little bit confusing here, because if I was a CNBS viewer, I would assume that Ross has an ETF that holds many, many, many tens of millions of dollars worth of Tesla stock, as opposed to, let's do the math here, many, many, many thousands of dollars worth of Tesla stock. As I record this, the 2,000 shares in the GK ETF would account for just over $300,000 worth of Tesla stock. Tesla skeptic, is there anything out there that would make you start to, to buy again and start to believe the narrative again? Yeah, I, you know, first of all, I'm not a Tesla skeptic. I'm a, a huge fan of the company and I love the products. I think they're the best cars on the road. I'm a skeptic of Elon Musk's management style at okay. this point. Fair point. So, you know, what got us. <laughs> yeah, just want to make sure everyone got that. Musk with his terrible track record, horrific failure rate, absolute incompetence and failure to create any value in the public or private markets. His ineptitude as a leader of multiple companies across a couple of decades, his failure to disrupt multiple industries, to execute, to inspire the world's best and brightest, to work tirelessly, all clear signs that he's an incompetent leader and manager of people. Great point here from Ross. I totally understand why you would not have confidence in his ability to do what he's done exceptionally over the last couple of decades. Yes. <clears throat> What got Tesla to be as successful as it is was a very focused CEO who worked very hard for Tesla. But ever since he's left Tesla and bought Twitter, 
Um, basically, nobody's been running the ship, and the ship is clearly having a lot of issues. So let's ask about some of those issues. I mean, Cybertruck is an interesting one. It's such an unusual looking vehicle. I mean, to put it nicely, I guess, uh, it's a weird car. And a lot of people said, yeah. you know, this is either going to be just a huge hit. There's just buyers out there that we, we haven't identified in the car market before who are going to love this thing and they're going to flock to it and it's going to turn the stock around completely. And other people said this is like an Edsel, you know, coming down the road at you. How do you think that's shaking out? I mean, obviously, we've, see, we've seen some mechanical difficulties, too. But is, right. the, is the Cybertruck living up to the hype? Well, we have one Cybertruck at the office, and, and I'm actually one of those those customers that ordered a Cybertruck, I paid for the Cybertruck and they took my money. And I've tried calling Tesla several times to see what's going on with my truck. And, and I really no can't get a straight answer from anybody. But the truck we have, we've had a pretty good experience. Uh, now, based on what Ross said, it sounds like Ross claims that he paid the entire price of a Cybertruck, better part of $100,000 and is yet to receive his Cybertruck. Perhaps Ross can clarify, but my suspicion is what he's actually referring to is the literal $100 deposit to reserve one and he's yet to be offered to actually take delivery and pay the full amount experience with you drive a cyber truck down the street children are like running after you staring and pointing the, i've never seen the consumer excitement around a product like like cyber truck which doesn't make it any less polarizing of a vehicle my wife is not happy on buying a cyber truck she's <laughs> like what are you going to do with this thing you know yeah right but it's a niche vehicle it really is a niche vehicle it's not a real truck that truck people would buy and that's right. Brain damage confirmed. Looks different, therefore can't do things that a truck can do. Spoiler alert, it can. Therefore, people who need a truck to do truck things won't buy it. Now, I do understand. It looks unique, and it will take time for a lot of people to realise what it's capable of doing. But spec for spec, in terms of features and functionality, this is a real truck. In fact, it's the most truck-like truck that's ever existed. Stainless steel exoskeleton. Bulletproof to a handgun. Crack-resistant glass. You can't chip the paint. Buff out scratches with some steel wool. Secure bed. Huge bed. Insane towing capacity. What is this guy talking about? Oh, wait. Uh, I know what's happening. Lots of emotions and very little reason. Well, maybe he's right. Maybe maybe Cybertruck really is only going to appeal to wealthy money managers living in California whose wives disapprove of their decision to buy one. So just wanted to close with this snapshot of some of these ETFs and their Tesla positions here in percentage terms. Gary Black's future fund. Tesla, the 16th largest position in the fund at the moment. 2.74% allocation, 1,842 shares. GK, 2,000 shares of Tesla stock, representing 1.6% of the fund. And Meet Kevin's PP, absent, entirely missing. 0.00% Tesla, 0 shares of Tesla. And the current date, 17th of April, 2024, that is in Australia. With Tesla's market cap, as I record this, $492.3 billion. Fascinating. Want more content? Early access? Bunch of perks? Click the links in the pinned comment. AG1 has given me a massive, meaningful boost in energy, allowing me to do a lot more every day, including using my brain more and using my body more. I highly recommend you guys and girls check it out. It's an excellent way to fill in nutritional gaps. It's got 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients, plus prebiotics and probiotics and digestive enzymes and adaptogens to help you deal with stress. Plus, if you click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR, you can get yourself a one-year free supply of vitamin D3 and K2. But don't take my word for it. Here's what some of you guys and girls have to say. AG1 has changed my life. I was, as you described, treating myself like a circus. I ate like trash, rarely exercised, used alcohol as a stress crutch, cannabis also. AG1 is what gave me the kick in the ass, got me back to the gym, motivated me to do more for myself, family, my business, etc. Keep doing what you do. Now, I know there's some skeptics, the same kind of people who think Elon Musk is a fraud reading this going, what do you thought? There's no way that's possible, bro. It must be a placebo effect. Believe it or not, this is a recurring theme. If you give your body everything it needs to feel and perform its best, including having a lot more energy, you'll need ways to use that energy. For me personally, that includes more exercise, moving my body more, more social activity, and more cognitively demanding tasks, including producing a fuck ton of exclusive content over on Twitter and on Patreon, plus my daily YouTube uploads. The proof's in the pudding. On to another testimonial from a viewer of this channel. SMR, you asked me to provide feedback on AG1. Here it is. It has helped with mental acuity, stamina, and intestinal waste management. Uh, can't read between the lines. It certainly helps with regularity and digestion. That's what the digestive enzymes are for. It has also dramatically reduced my cravings for sugar. You guys need to stop eating sugar. It's fucking poison. I'm 50, 5'9", and overweight, aka a fat motherfucker. I think that's a technical term for overweight, isn't it? 
Is it fat motherfucker or obese? I can't remember. I average 100 hours a week in the West Texas oil fields as a safety supervisor. Jesus Christ, dude. No wonder you're struggling to keep your weight under control. 100 hours a week. Brutal. It has helped me lose weight. It is not an appetite suppressant. It can help fat people suppress cravings and motivation to be healthier is critical for changing your diet. Love you, brother. Again, this is a great point and something people really don't seem to grasp. If you have more energy, everything becomes easier. It's like turning on easy mode for life. A few years ago, before I was taking AG1, my health was trash. I was struggling to get through the day, had afternoon fatigue. The last thing I wanted to do was either use my brain or move my body. Didn't have the energy. Now, my biggest struggle every day is figuring out ways to use that energy. I'm exercising way more doing a lot more with my friends and family, and, of course, my work output has increased substantially. And you can fact check me. Check out the average length of my videos I was posting to YouTube three years ago. Need I say more? And one final testimonial. Love this one. Okay, here's the deal for me with this AG1 shit. I'm 41 years old and not the type to eat, drink, smoke, or sleep healthy, so I was skeptical. That being said, here's what I experienced. Day one, meh. Day two, afternoon fatigue was about 45 minutes late. Day three, zero afternoon fatigue. Day four, zero afternoon fatigue plus extra energy. Day five, again, zero afternoon fatigue plus energy. Wondering, what the f really? See, this is the thing, right? The results for many people are just almost too good to be true. This, this is the same experience I had. My afternoon fatigue just vanished out of nowhere. I'm like, wait, what the f Why am I not tired in the afternoons anymore? Surely, it's not that AG1, is it? Turns out it was. Day six and seven, same thing. Day eight, same thing. Plus, I had the want to get things done around the house that I normally would slack off and not get done. Again, the point, extra energy, you'll need to use it, you'll find ways to use it. Day 9, 10, and 11, and today is day 12. I fucking love it. So however you managed to get me to buy it, I'm so glad you did. Thank you so much, SMR. It really changed me so far. Guys, this shit really works. Just try it. By the way, this is the reason I continue to relentlessly promote AG1. A lot of people get real fucking mad in the comments. Oh my god, Snake Oil Salmon sold out. Oh my god, he's a scammer. This is fraud. But Constantly... I'm pretty sure everyone making these comments is also currently short Tesla stock. I'm not particularly concerned about people having a negative perception, those folks suffering from small brain syndrome, still living in my bum's basement syndrome, etc., writing mean comments, claiming AG1's a scam or it doesn't work. I mean, bro, when I get feedback like this, this is what keeps me going. Just try this stuff for a month, and if you don't get these results, get your money back. See, it's a literal no-brainer. It's an IQ test at this point in time. Testimonial after testimonial after testimonial like this. Get your money back if it doesn't work. Just try it for a month, and if it doesn't work... Get your money back. Today's the day. It's finally time. Be like this guy who was a massive skeptic, but finally, after a thousand promotions in a row, caved in, tried AG1, and has results like this. Head to drinkag1.com slash SMR, or click the link at the pinned comment, and please, let me know how you're feeling in a few weeks' time. And now, if you'll excuse me, time to put my extra energy to good use. I'll be recording some more exclusive content for Patreon and my Twitter subscribers. So click the links at the pinned comment, see you over on Twitter and or Patreon, and don't forget to grab your AG1. Love ya.